How do we help our patients make meaningful, sustainable lifestyle changes? Find out today from the author of The Habit Revolution. And this is part two of two. So if you missed it, go back and check out part one. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Which I think is always important when we're talking to our patients about anything. Yeah. Right? Like, it shouldn't be our reasons for doing it. We have to identify their reasons for doing it, which yeah. is the core of motivational interviewing. You're identifying their reasons for wanting to do something and then, you know, having them reflect on it and why, you know, this activity is consistent with their values. Having them find their own reasons. That's exactly it. And if someone is super resistant and they're, like, just not coming up with anything, then I on I don't even try to work with those people. I'm like, that's cool. I'm I'm not trying to sort of persuade you to do anything. You come back to me if and when you're ready. I'll be here. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> because there's really no point right in trying to push taking, someone up a hill they're not willing to climb. Have to give to another one. So I, I like that. I like that approach. Okay, so let's go back to that original question. Right, we had talked about the. Emergency medicine physician, urgent care, who just had like one visit with someone. Um, and so now let's talk about if we have someone with a chronic illness, right? Let's oh. say your primary care physician who's going to be seeing people once or multiple times per year, every year, and you're going to have a long relationship with them or, you know, really any type of physician that's dealing with chronic illness, which is, you know, most if not all of us. How are we approaching habit change differently now that we can see them over, you know, a long period of time? We don't have a ton of time with them yeah. each visit. And we're not seeing them many times a year, but, you know, it's a long relationship. So how are we approaching this differently? Yeah, it's definitely much easier when you're seeing somebody multiple times because you can create accountability and you can really have a much better rapport with them than if you're just seeing them once off. So we're already in a much better position. Beautiful. One thing we want to do is get them to use a habit tracker. And a habit tracker is essentially when we write down or they write down the habit that they want to create or break. And then they tick off every single time they have achieved that goal. And what that does is it's reward learning. We don't grow out of it. You know, when you give a child a gold star and they feel awesome for getting the gold star, they're like, I want to do it again. We don't grow out of that as adults. And a habit tracker does just that. It gives them a little hit of dopamine whenever they've achieved their habit and given themselves a tick. But it works in a beautiful way as well in that if they bring their habit tracker to their next appointment, now you've got solid accountability. They're doing it because for them, but they also know that you're checking in on them and no one wants to displease their doctor. And so they're going to be much more motivated to do the behavior that they're wanting to do. And you can talk about it. You can say, hey, I've noticed that during this week, things weren't so smooth. What was going on? What were some of the barriers? And then working through that, how can we make it easier? What's another trigger we can use? Maybe this trigger is not really working. Could we look at a different time of the day or a different trigger than the one that we've been using? And that's how we create these solid plans. It's always through this trial and error. It's a dynamic back and forth process. And we get to do that when we're seeing someone for you know, a, a long extended period of time. Do you have an example of a habit tracker? Like, is there a specific app that you recommend? Yeah, on my website, I have got a whole table of all the habit trackers that are available on the app store. There's so many and I've written sort of their like features and their costs. I've also got a paper-based habit tracker for some people that prefer to just have a physical tick. You can also download that from my website. I don't have a particular app that I recommend because it's got to work for you. You've got to like the interface and you know, what it looks like and feels like. For me, it's very much flavor of the month. I'm like, what color do I like this month? And I'll download that app to use. So there's no affiliate link? Is that what you're saying? We're not going to your Amazon store where you're getting? Not yet. I'm not selling you anything just yet. I'm just giving you a free resource. <laughs> you know, we were talking a little about the habit design, right? And so you're going to have that, the tick, you're going to have the, on the habit tracker to give them that dopamine hit and also gives them that accountability to yeah. themselves and to us so that we can help them with that. You're going to have a trigger. You're going to make sure that the, the habit is not too small, that it's not stimulating enough, 
not too big that it's overwhelming and they end up getting frustrating and abandoning it. So having that sweet spot. Are there any other mistakes that you see with habit design that we should try to avoid? Our brains are only capable of making up to three changes at one time. So we don't want to give our patients more goals than just those up to three things. And actually research shows that if we just focus on one change at a time, we're much more likely to achieve it and sustain it than if we're trying to do multiple things. So maybe just try with one, one thing. And then once you're seeing that they're doing it quite consistently and it's becoming more automatic, add another one and then add another one, but don't give them too many changes. It's, I think it's really common to want to overhaul someone's life because there are so many things that we can help them with, like their diet and exercise and sleep and meditation. And that's what they saw in a magazine. They saw yeah, someone and... did that and then they yeah. made a movie about it and they traveled <laughs> across the country with their blender juicing. And now I want to do that too, right? So yes, and that's what yeah, they yeah. see. That's what they see. And they think that they can do it too, right? Yeah. And our brains just don't work like that. It's not reality. It's literally only up to three changes at one time. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're trying to make lifestyle changes. Too many goals or goals that are just too big. Do not try to go hard or go home. It does not work. But what if our patients headed in that direction, right? They're like, they're super motivated. I'm going to do it this time. That's, I have a tough time trying to talk them out of it, right? You don't want to tell them that they can't do that. You don't want to tell them that they shouldn't, right? Because mm -hmm. they're motivated. They're excited. You don't want to rain on their parade. So mm -hmm. what do you do in that situation? They're like ready to go. Yeah. They need some direction. They're not ready to take it. What do you, how do you talk to them about that? Oh, it's such a real thing. And, and it's kind of cool to see someone who's really ambitious. And yet, like you said, you don't want to really want to, you don't want to sort of dull, like dull their sparkle because they're on fire. And you know what? That fire might motivate them for a little while. So cool. Like go for it. It's not going to be sustainable. You and I both know that. And I think we can just allow pain to be their teacher. We can give them a little heads up, like always warn them, let them know what, what you think may happen or let them know that like, hey, this is awesome that you're feeling motivated now. Just know that this is a pretty big goal and you're making a really big change. So let's just see how you go with it. And then, you know, once they inevitably have a little stumble, that's when you're there to guide them and say, all right, how can we re reduce this just a little bit so that we can make it sustainable? The game here is about consistency, not intensity. And remind them of that, that our habit change is all about the consistency of something, not how hard or intense we go with it. And just dial it back then when they'll be ready. I actually think that phrase is a really good one to insert in that situation. Like, yeah. I love your enthusiasm. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. You listen, you've got great things in front of you, but I want you to remember it's not about intensity. Mm. It's about consistency. So that's where I really want you to focus your attention. Right. So if it doesn't, if you're not able to do all of this, just consistency over, over intensity. Yeah. That's a great phrase. Like, <laughs> I, I love having these like little phrases that we can insert into our visits because we're so short on time with our patients mm. that like catchphrases. Are, yeah. Are, are really important. Winners, yes. Really important. Love that. Okay, so you had said towards the beginning of the show, and I think at this point it'll be the first episode, it's how you thought of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I wasn't someone who was, I can't remember what you said exactly. Like, I wasn't someone who, who was into fitness, or I wasn't someone as if you are now but weren't then, right? Yeah. And it was almost, you were alluding to an identity shift. Yeah. That you true. had in, in yourself. And, and this to me is always something that like, this is what the patients read about in the magazines, that someone had an epiphany moment, right? There was an epiphany and it changed their life. Mm. And that's what in that situation where they're like, they've got this big goal and they're going to run with it. They're hoping that they're the patient that also had this epiphany moment and it's going to change how they think about themselves forever. Yes, you know, when they're in realistic. It's like lightning striking. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately what they're talking about is it's an identity shift, right? Yeah. Where they Like runners run, don't, not because it's, the runners run because they're runners. Yeah. Right. Like they'll find a time, even if it's not a habit, even if it's not, even if it's raining out, even if it's, they're in a new place with old shoes, like they're going to run because they're runners. Yes. Yeah. At what point and how do we facilitate that type of identity shift? Because oh, I think I that's like, yourself. once you've done it, once you've yeah. done that, then I feel like you can do anything. Totally. Because we behave in ways that align with our identity. 
we, if you, and it, and it feel, we get, we actually get a cognitive dissonance if we do something other than that. So if I'm someone who I believe I'm a really honest person and then I tell a lie, that's going to be so uncomfortable because fundamentally I believe that I am an honest person. And it's exactly the same with lifestyle changes. The earlier that we can adopt a new identity, the better. Like fake it till you make it. Say to yourself, I'm an active person. I am a, I, I'm someone who treats my body well. I am a healthy eater. I am a healthy person. I have great sleep routines. It, the more you can say that and believe that, the more you will adopt the behaviors that align with that because anything outside of that is going to feel uncomfortable. And you don't need, it's not some like fluffy affirmation that you're writing on your mirror, but you don't truly believe it. Find ways, like rely on that confirmation bias. Find ways where you are a healthy person. Notice when you are being active and remind yourself you're being an active person. Show up for yourself and notice when you're showing up for yourself in those ways and align your thoughts and your mindset and your words accordingly. And I think we we can do that with our patients as well, right? If they're like, let's say they need to exercise more, right? Ooh. A good question would be, what do you do right now that's physically active? Well, I walk the dog. Right. Oh, so you are an active person. You're already yeah. walking the dog. Like, and because you're a an authority as a physician, mm -hmm. you're an authority in that situation, you yeah. can actually, the way you use your words can influence the way the patient thinks about themselves. Huge. Oh, well, I just yeah. do a bit of gardening. You garden? Oh, man, that is really physical. You're lifting the dirt and you're digging and you're up and you're down and you're moving on. That is really good. So you are, okay, so you are an active person. Okay, what else? And then you kind of build from there. Yeah. You like, you can build their self-efficacy, especially if there's someone who doesn't necessarily believe that about Big themselves. Time. You can, you can cr create that for them. And we're in a, you know, as healthcare as their physician, their trusted physician, we're in a unique situation where re we can really hold sway over things like that. So true. And they know that you're seeing hundreds of other people. And so if you're saying to them that they're active, in a way, you've compared it to the hundreds of other people that you're seeing. And so it holds more, it holds weight. It's, it feels awesome. And you're like, oh, this person thinks, this person who I hold in high regard, who has all this authority, thinks I'm active. I must be active compared to all these other people. So it's a great, it's such a great tool to use. I love that you pull that up. And as someone who's done this before, I can tell you this is, this, it makes me feel good when I can put that in a visit, you know, we're always depleted. We're always exhausted. We're always like trying to run on time and angry patients and disgrunt and you know, whatever it's all right. Everyone's job is hard. Our job is hard too. Yeah. But this is a way that really I've found really fills my cup. I just try and look for ways to put that into different situations to build people's self-efficacy. You have like an exhausted newborn's mother who's there and they like feel like they're like they can't breastfeed and they've like messed up their kid for life because they're, you know, just put a hand on their shoulder. I know that we're not talking about habits right now. I've gone off the rails a little bit, no, no, but like great. putting a hand on the shoulder would be like, I see you and you are doing a great job like that oh. will you'll feel the weight come off their shoulder. So any opportunity you can to build up your patience a little bit, be their hype person. It's going to help and it's going to help and you it, feel better. It makes and you it feel will. So good. And it also builds rapport with your patient. And that is golden because if you build rapport with someone, they're much more likely to listen to you. We know that the patients who adhere to their medications are generally the ones that like their doctors not the ones that, you know, are listening to their doctors. So if you can build that rapport through that beautiful compassion, oh, I think it'll do wonders for changing their habits. Well, on a positive note like that, I want to take a negative, right? I want to throw some shade, okay? okay. So mm -hmm. I want you to tell us all of the habit nonsense that you see out there mm -hmm. that you want to dispel. Oh like, my what, God. Is the, yes. what is the stuff that you see on your Instagram feed or you're linked and you just cringe. You're like, that's not how it works. <laughs> so let's hear it. Okay. The biggest and the most common one is that it takes 21 days to change a habit. So cringe. It is not true. There's no evidence behind it. It does not take 21 days to change a habit. It takes anywhere. It's a sliding scale. It's anywhere from two weeks to up to 10 months to create a new habit. The sort of the median point is about 66 days. So you want to work with 10 weeks on average. 
And so is that the goal that you're telling the patient to set in order to like be like, and, and how does that number come up? Because I feel like with habits, like any something that you've been doing for years might evaporate the following day if the situation isn't right anymore. So then yeah. where do those numbers come from? So there's a bunch of research around this, but essentially where, like how long it takes you to develop a habit is going to depend on how habitual you are as a person, how complex the habit is. So the more complex the behavior, the longer it's going to take to develop. So for example, if you say to someone, I want you to wash your hands before you eat, that's much easier than saying to someone, I want you to go to the gym every day. Because with washing your hands, unless washing their hands before they eat is like, this is why I don't work with children. It is a whole other beast. And I'm like, I can't reason with these people. <laughs> no, no. Beyond logic. <laughs> yeah. But washing your hands, you know, there's generally a sink around. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. And if they're motivated enough, they can develop that habit fairly quickly. Whereas getting to the gym requires getting changed, getting in the car, having plenty of time, motivation. It, it's a more complex behavior. And so it's going to take a bit longer. The other thing is how much reward you get from your habit, it'll develop quicker, which is one of the reasons I was saying before, you need to enjoy the behavior that you're wanting to change. Because if you're not having a good time, it's really hard to want to do it again. So those are the things that it takes to change a habit. When we say to people, it's going to take 21 days, we actually are setting them up to fail. Because after three weeks, if they're not there yet, they're like, hey, doc, I'm, this is still hard work. And I'm yeah. not, this is not automatic. And so maybe I'm just not very good at this, or I'm just not going to achieve this. But if you work with 10 weeks as the average, it's just a much more realistic number. Anything else out there that you really oh, yeah. want to, any bubbles you want to burst? Yeah. So I've, I mentioned before the go hard, go home. I cannot stand that because we know that that doesn't work either. And so it is also setting people up to fail. And the other one, and this is a bit nuanced because you have to kind of understand habit research to see why this doesn't work. Okay. You know, when you hear people say, when you achieve all these things that you set out for yourself, give yourself a reward, like take yourself out to a movie or buy yourself some new active wear or go hang out with your friends, like give yourself a reward for doing the things that you wanted to do. That also doesn't work because you have to get the reward instantly. It can't be oh, something okay. that you look forward to. It has to be. That's what you were saying earlier with the habit tracker. Yeah. The habit tracker is that dopamine hit that's immediate. Exactly. And if you're having to like go to the store or whatever, okay. It's gone. So that, yeah. yeah. It has to happen in the moment. And so the reward that we should be encouraging people is give yourself a tick and notice how good it feels, that sense of accomplishment, the sense of achievement, the fact that you did something that was hard, like go you. And that's the best reward. It's that emotive experience. So don't go out. I mean, go out and buy yourself new active wear for sure. But don't do it as like to reward yourself for being active and depending on that as what's going to help you to continue to be active. That's not going to work like that. So I'd say those are the biggest sort of mythy things that I see consistently with habits. Love it. I love it. Okay, so let's go back to that initial scenario. Now it's the last one, right? Last situation. You're a coach, right? And so now you're working with someone for extended periods of time, you know, more, much more frequently than just so than someone with a chronic illness that you see for short visits, you know, maybe a few times a year. So you, you're really to get you're really able to get in the weeds with them. How are you helping that person differently than, you know, the one we were talking about earlier? I think in this scenario, you've just got a lot more to play with. You've got probably more habits you can play with, more scenarios you can play with. You can amend the plans earlier and quicker and therefore have more success with it. So if you notice someone's habit tracker isn't consistent, for example, they're not doing their habit as frequently as they would like to, you can pivot the plan earlier than if you're just seeing them a bit more intermittently. But the strategies are the same. And actually, no matter what kind of habit we want to change, whether it's lifestyle or like work or relationships, the strategies are the same. It's just how much effort and investment we apply to them that's going to create the outcome. So it wouldn't honestly be hugely different than that middle scenario. Great. Well, that gives a lot of hope for, the, for us because 
That's what you've got. <laughs> well, yeah, that's where we're. That's where we are. That's the situation <laughs> that we're in. Okay, so is there anything else that we didn't touch on today that you would want specifically physicians to know about habit? Things that you'd want us to bring to our visits with our patients? I think it's really good to know that although someone might have been doing something consistently, that life happens and setbacks are an inevitable part of the journey. It's not if we have a setback, it's when. And so expect those to happen. And maybe you can help your patients with some kind of bounce back strategy. Encourage them, tell them that this setback is normal and it's to be expected and they're just human. Encourage self-compassion and just help them get back on the wagon as quickly as possible. That's going to be the best thing rather than, you know, making them sort of feel bad or feel like they're abnormal for having, it's like, oh, you've been doing this exercise so well. What happened? Like, we don't want to be doing that. We want to be doing it is so okay for you to have this hiatus. We all have it. Life happens. We get stressed. It's all good. How can I help and support you to get back on track again? That's going to be the most influential and positive conversation you could have with your patients. This may be incorrect, but I think I remember from smoking cessation that it takes the average person like six times to quit. Yeah. And so telling them, listen, it takes the average person six times to quit. So for all the people that quit cold turkey the first time and never went back, there's someone who it took them 12 times. And you're going to fall somewhere in there or maybe even outside of there. But the goal is not to, is, is to anticipate that it will happen. Mm. And when it does, recognize it, don't beat yourself up for it and be willing to get back on the horse or back on the wagon or whatever, yeah. you know, analogy you're going to be <laughs> using. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great example. Oh. All right. Amazing. And so if people want to find you, right, they want to find you, the your Habit Change Institute, the book, The Habit Revolution, where do we find you? So you can find me on my website, which is drgenacleo.com. And on there, I've got a free Habit Masterclass. You can sign up to that and get five short videos on all things, how, what are new habits, how to break old habits, why self-control doesn't work. And The Habit Revolution, you can get that at most bookstores. It's on Amazon. It's also on Audible and Kindle. And then I'm also on social media as Dr. Gina Cleo. And if you check it out on Audible, she did it herself. So you can hear the same voice. I did. For eight hours, you can listen to my voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Dr. Gina Cleo, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and help us help our patients. And thank you for all that you do to help our patients. Thank you. It's been an honor to share this time with you. Thanks for listening. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.